Proverbs chapter 13. We'll be there in just a second. I believe the message that he sent us tonight is a message that the whole world needs to hear. I told you this morning he's preparing us for something. Well, tonight, I believe he's focusing this message on Cagosville Church. I've told you before, and I, I don't try to, I will never quench the spirit. The Bible says, do not quench the spirit. But I also, it is my duty to tell you, as we are blessed here in this church, and we and we get new families, and we get new people, and, and we're growing. And, and for those of you that hadn't got to hear the choir yet, they sing absolutely beautiful. You've got a blessing in store for yourself. I just see things happening, and I see people growing. Well, let me tell you something. The enemy will not take that sitting still. He is going to try to fight us, and he's going to try to throw stuff in, and he's going to try to make problems right here in this church. And folks, if we let him inside this door, we can have problems. As good as we all get along, and as, as much as we love each other, if one of us lets him in our heart, we bring him through that door with us, folks, we can have problems. And the devil has no business in here. The devil has no business in our lives. And he needs to stay in hell. That's where he needs to stay and stay away from us. But I'm telling you tonight, he's not going to let it go without a fight. So, but here's the, here's the beautiful thing. All he is is a hiccup to us. As long as we don't feed into him, he has no power over us. He cannot hurt us. Now, you know, we've, we've talked about this before. And I've told you some of the silly, silly things that I've heard churches split over before. We cannot let that happen on our watch. And folks, as we grow and we begin to get closer to God, I'm just telling you before we move on tonight, be ready for the attacks of the enemy. And he will attack you at home. He'll attack you here if you let him. He'll attack you wherever you allow it. But think on those things that are holy. Think on those things that are good. Think on those things that are high. And folks, I'm telling you, the devil cannot touch us. As God began to give me this message, it came over an invitation to play golf. I have not played golf in over seven years. Not even sure they sell enough balls because I would lose so many if we played, but a dear friend of mine is retired now, and all he does is play golf. Now, I can think of harder lives to have than that. To wake up and drive out every morning and get in your golf cart and play golf. He's got the tiger by the tail, so to speak. And he always, every time he sees me, he says, let's go. Let's go. Well, I know what would happen if I went. Number one, I'd be the youngest person there. Because <laughs> his group is a little older than me. But if I played and had a good time, you know what they would say? Come back tomorrow. We can do this again. And would I be tempted to do that? I got plenty of vacation and sick time. Sure. Then what would they say about the third day? Come on back. We're, you know, we can beat them tomorrow. We're doing good. Mm. Mm. Then would I be tempted possibly? And then they might say, you know what? If you went ahead and retired, you could play with us every day. Could their conversations and those golf games lead to me making a decision to retire before I should? You bet they could. How many of you have ever known a married person, their friend gets divorced and they begin to hang out with their friend who is now single and very shortly then they are divorced. It's never a good thing when, when a marriage starts hanging out with a single because you're looking for problems. Is it a good idea for an alcohol, a recovering alcoholic to go hang out in a bar? I hope you see where we're going tonight. Our flesh is easily influenced. You know why God wants us to read his word every day and to pray every day? Because he wants us to be able to withstand the attack of the enemy. Now, I'm going to tell you something. 
if we as a church family, if we stay in this word and we stay praying, we pray every day and we seek him, we keep reading, that was not going to have any luck with us. But what if we stop? It's a slow process. Well, I didn't get a chance to talk to God today. I'll talk to him tomorrow. Or I, I didn't get to fully read today. I'll read tomorrow. What does that lead to? That leads to that second golf game the second day. And then pretty soon you're retiring from reading God's word. And you've retired from praying. Then, my friend, he's through that door because he's in your heart and he's in these pews and he'll have us looking at each other in a different way and we'll begin to fight and we'll begin to have jealousy and we'll begin to let the devil reign where it's Jesus' place to reign and he will cause trouble. He is the prince of all lies. And now tonight, we're good. We all know we love each other. Please hang on to that. Please don't let the enemy in. Don't let the enemy change how you look at each other, how you look at your church family. We love each other. But our flesh is so easily influenced that we must guard against putting ourselves in bad situations. You know, I told you the story of the informant who turned to be a friend who ended up coming to church with us and, and, and he had went to school with my wife and and. and of course, he credited her for getting him through high school for him cheating off her paper. And then when he found out she was my wife, it kind of changed things. And, and I've told you this before. He was the two things in my life that I didn't want anything to do with. One was a drug dealer and the other was a homosexual. Oh, how he changed my life. I never would accept his lifestyle and friends you can't because that lifestyle is a sin but you can certainly accept the sinner and he worked his way into our family and like i've told you before many of you in here probably didn't wasn't around us much when our girls were little but if i left my girls with you you were right up there next to god you were either close family or I trusted you 125%. And there come a time when I would have left my girls with this man. I saw God work in him. And I saw God begin to change him. And he would always say, he said, you know, when I see your daughters climb up in your lap at church, because they were little then, and hug you, he said, that's what I want. And he'd have big old tears streaming down his face. And he says, I know my lifestyle now can never lead me to that. And he said, I want that. He said, I want a relationship with God. I want a family. Well, to make a long story short, you can ask my wife. This, this man could talk. When he called me on the phone, you pretty much guarantee you're there 45 minutes. And I'd even tell him, there was times... I could lay the phone down and run, do something, and come back, and he'd never broke stride. He could talk. And uh, he began to, after he met Jesus, folks, you see, so many people tell you once you, miss, once you meet Jesus, it's easy street. No, it's not. You still have troubles, and you still have trials, and folks, you're still going to have heartache and you're going to have heartbreak but jesus christ will get you through but as he began to meet jesus and and see what jesus could do then he wanted to take jesus back into that world that he had come out of and he wasn't ready yet he wasn't that strong and it cost him his life Our flesh is easily influenced. I'm telling you tonight, guard your homes, guard your church, guard your hearts against the enemy. If you would, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 13. When you find that, if you would, stand for the reading of God's word. Proverbs 13, and I'm going to read verse 20. It says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, 
but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. And we thank you, Lord, for the beautiful songs that have been sung tonight, Lord, and the testimonies, Lord. We just thank you for everything. God, I just pray tonight as it comes to the preaching of your word that you'll empty this vessel out, God, of my flesh. And God, please forgive me, Lord, of my sins. Clean me, Lord. Prepare this vessel to deliver this message, God. And I pray, Lord, that you just cleanse us all, Lord, and prepare us to receive this message so that we can apply it to our hearts and lives and be what you've called us to be. And in Jesus' precious name, his children all prayed. Amen. Amen. Boy, how easily we read through Scripture sometimes and we don't pay attention to the words. But I want you to listen to this tonight, folks. He that walketh with the wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Do you know what the word destroyed means in the, in the Bible, in that kind of text? It means hell. Your soul will be destroyed. Companion of fools. In other words, let me put it into Hector Lango. Hang with the wrong crowd will lead you to destruction. I had to, I had to smile because I think Sister Frankie is an angel that God sent to me to remind me that the message most times is what he wanted me to preach because tonight I sat down in front of her and she began to talk about a child that she used to teach that didn't have any parental backing, had no hope. And then now I have dealt with him for years and years and years. He run with the wrong crowd. Folks, I want to tell you tonight, if you don't, if you think tonight you don't have anything to be thankful for, be thankful, number one, that you didn't run with the wrong crowd, or if you did, that you got away from the wrong crowd. And how do I know that? Because you're sitting here. And I know all of you well enough to know that your walk with God is sincere. So at some point, you may have been with the wrong crowd, but you left them. Can you imagine like this young man that me and Sister Frankie was talking about, we see it all the time. What, what if there is no support? What, what if you went home from school and nobody cared about you? There might be food, there might not. If you have trouble with your homework, nobody cares. So do you think the child's going to care? Of course not. There's nobody to tell you about Jesus. There's nobody to make you get up on Sunday morning and go to, go to Sunday school and go to church. They don't go. They don't care. They don't talk about God. Their God is in a bottle or their God is in a needle. Thank God that you didn't have that. And if you did, thank God that you overcome it. Because you can overcome it. But you see, we see it a lot. And we've talked about it in here a lot about when Christian kids go to college and they go crazy. I can't remember the show, but I used to watch it where the Amish raised their kids to a certain age and then they let them go out into the world for however long and then they got to decide whether they want to live in the world or they want to live with how they were raised. Folks, in a, in, in a different sense, that's exactly what we do. You raise your kids up here in Hector, Arkansas, and what they see is limited. I don't care, what, I don't care how wild they are, what they see is here is limited compared to the big cities. But then we send them, we pay a lot of money, and we send them to a institution of higher learning. That's what they call themselves. If you want to be honest about it, there's no higher learning that goes on there. We pay them to take their philosophy and try to change our children. But 1 Corinthians 1533 addresses this very issue. It says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. When I read this, I just lit up. Because most of the time, and this is, this is hard to say, and it's hard for a lot of people to hear, but they say, Well, I sent my kids to college, and they just went crazy. Did you know a lot of times they was crazy before they went to college? And mom and dad didn't know what they were doing? It says good manners. 
That's the problem. We're sending our kids to college with good manners. We're not sending them with Jesus Christ. Folks, Sister Kay, I can't help but think about Brother Dale right now. Me and Brother Dale, if you want to fire us up, you start, you start talking about that straight gate and that narrow way. And few be there that find it. You know, there's a lot of people that say, well, college earned my kid. No. <laughs> you might as well step up and take the blame. You had not instilled Christ in them before you sent them, if we're just being honest. Now, sometimes, yes, there's no black and white where you can paint every time this happens. But a lot of times, people like to blame other people for the downfall of their children when it is our fault. We did not raise them. We did not pray with them. We did not read with them. We did not teach them. Uh, I heard it put this way. We have raised a generation of snowflakes. In other words, when it gets hot enough, they melt. When the heat comes from the world, from the world, they don't have Jesus in them. They can't stand up to the world. Folks, can you imagine what this world is going to be like when Jesus takes his church home? I think you'll agree with me now. It's hotter in this world now than it's ever been. And I'm not talking about the air conditioner heat. I'm talking about the media that controls our country is 110% anti-God. They will not, they're anti the president, they're anti anything that even remotely stands for God. They want nothing to do with it. You remember when the news used to do the little in, a segment at the end? You'd have a five-minute pep-up story to make you feel good? That's not even about God. Their pep-up story now is how this young girl has come out of the closet and she's admitting she's homosexual and how courageous she is. I hope you see what they're twisting and what they're doing. Have we raised our children to be able to stand the heat because they're going to be faced with things we never had to face be faced with when we were kids to fit in as they say you can see that this has reared its head in church as well and we can say you know all's well but it's not if you want to see this kind of thing rear its head in a church start helping people and you say what do you mean there will be those in the church that always are against helping people now they may not come out and just say you know I'm against this or I'm against this but the way they respond there's a negativity to it and then they begin to look down on somebody or they'll say, well, that person don't need this. That person don't need this. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. And folks, if we're honest, we're all guilty of that sometimes. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need to be good stewards. Please stay with me. We do need to be good stewards. And obviously, if, a, if somebody who's addicted to methamphetamine comes to us, you know, and, and they need help, obviously, we don't hand that person cash and send them back out the door because they're just going to go buy more drugs. I believe if we let the Holy Spirit guide us, we can make the right decisions. But I think I've told you this before. God has a sense of humor. I hope you know that. God enjoys us. We're supposed to laugh and have a good time. Just like Miss Kay, I pick on her for driving in the parking lot at 80 mile an hour sometime. She knows I'm kidding. Or Miss Carolyn, I pick on her for putting a permanent in my hair and scarring me in the sixth grade. She knows I'm kidding. God wants us to have a good time, but God also wants us to know. He tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to cry. There's seasons, folks. But when it comes to your heart, we talked this morning about a stony heart and a fleshy heart. And what I was going to tell you about God's sense of humor, 
is I'm not too far from retiring now. And, and we were sitting in a classroom the other day, and uh, yes, I'm one of the oldest ones in there. And most of the people who went through troop school with me, they were sitting around there, and they were talking about how many times they've took the sergeant's exam. Some's four, some's 15, some's took it 20. And they come to me, and I said, never took it. Didn't want it. And they said, you didn't want to be promoted? I said, nope, sure didn't. I said, I want to do my job, go home, and I don't want to be responsible for anybody. And they said, what else do you do? I go, I pastor a church. <laughs> uh, God has a sense of humor. And God has broke my heart several times. Uh, you know, I told you, I knew going in, one of the things I lacked was having the love that I needed to have for other people. Folks, I'll assure you, and I stand on God's word tonight. If you ask for that, he will give it to you. Because it's in his will. And he says, if you ask anything in his will, he'll give it to you. Well, with the good comes the bad. When people you love, when you, when you hear them say things or see them do things, that they shouldn't be doing, folks, it hurts. And it's not easy. How many of you have ever tried to witness to a really close family member? Hardest people in the world to witness to. I, you can ask my wife how many times I tried I was, gonna, I was gonna talk to my dad. I'd pray and I'd get ready and I'd go down there and I just could not do it. It's hard, isn't it? Well, folks, I, I owe it to you to tell you exactly what God puts on my heart. And I always will. And the day I don't, I promise you, you have my word that we will leave. God is telling us. He's hearing things he don't necessarily like. He's seeing things he don't necessarily like. And I'm not saying it's I'm saying it's in each one of us. Each one of us can do better. Each one of us can love more. Each one of us can read more. Each one of us can pray more. But what I'm scared of is that stony heart. And, you know, we've got to guard against that. And if God tells us to help A, we can't question A. We got to do what God tells us. If God tells us to help B, we can't question B. We've just got to do what God tells us to do. And I believe he has a work for us. And I don't ever want this church to get caught up in church business. And I hope I'm going to explain to you what I'm talking about. When we come to this church, Whatever your role is, if it's singer, pray, if you're a prayer, whatever your role is, do your role. Be, if you're a hand, be a hand. If you're a foot, be a foot. If you're an eye, be an eye. Because we're all supposed to work together. We can't all have the same role. I know Miss Joyce is wanting to preach, and I'm going to let her preach. I'm just going to, I'll just step down and let her preach, but I. God's wanting us to work together. And we've got to be really careful that jealousy don't ever creep in because I've seen it creep in. I've seen, je not, not here. I, praise God, that, that has never been an issue here. But I've been in churches where jealousy come in, power struggles come in. And folks, there's no, there's no point in it. If we come into this house, if Ken comes into this house to be the superintendent and lead singing, whatever Ken comes in here to do, and he does it to glorify God, then we're fine. If Miss Diane comes in to teach the children Sunday school out there and she teaches them and she comes to do it to glorify God, we're blessed. 
If Sister Frankie comes to teach Sunday school and she does it to glorify God, we're blessed. If I come in here to preach the word and I do it to glorify God, then we're blessed. Any time we do it for any reason other than to glorify God, you are in trouble. You're heading for trouble. Psalms 1 and 1 tells us, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Listen to this last line. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Folks, the men, we, done the, we started the Andy Griffith Bible study, and the episode was where he had the English butler, and he was taking care of Andy. And Andy and Barney didn't think that was a good idea, you know, because he knew he was getting on Andy's nerves. So Barney, and folks, we can laugh at him, and I do like to laugh at Barney, but a lot of times we're like Barney in this episode. Instead of encouraging Andy, he's being scornful toward the butler. How are you putting up with this? Why don't you just tell him? You know, and who of all people should Andy have told to behave? Barney. About the third time he locked me in the cell, we'd had a real <laughs> come to Jesus. But Andy was very patient with him. Andy became unpatient with the butler because Barney's needling him. Folks, we cannot be needlers. We cannot be scornful. Every one of us is blessed. You remember a few weeks ago we talked about the dot on the paper. The dot is your problems. The paper is your blessings. Look to your blessings. Don't look to your problems. Folks, we're blessed. But so it's so easy for people to get scornful. And I've heard it. I've heard it and I've prayed that God would remove that. I've been scornful. And I've had to ask for forgiveness. But we cannot let that get in. And here's the danger before we close. And I'm going to wrap this up. What about the new church philosophy? I firmly believe this is one of the reasons God's preparing us. Because if you can't see what this world is doing, especially to religion, you know, now in two different states, they have already upheld that you cannot come to the altar, that you cannot sing, and you cannot pray. Folks, <laughs> you are inviting God's wrath when you start making that kind of law. Now, keep in mind, we've already legalized murder of little babies. And me and my wife heard this this week, and I... It just such struck such a chord with me. Did you realize there is no such thing as traditional marriage? That don't exist. And you say, what do you mean? Because you put traditional in front of it. You don't have to. There's only one marriage, period. You don't, there is no traditional marriage. There's just marriage. And marriage is between a man and a woman. It is very clearly written in here. But oh, how we're changing things. Matter of fact, see what they've done to us? They've already got us to add a word to marriage. Oh, you're having a traditional marriage. <laughs> no, I'm having a marriage. There is no other kind of marriage. It don't exist. I don't care what your legislature pass. It don't exist. It conflicts with the law of God. And I don't care what option the doctor gives you. If you choose to take the life of your unborn baby, you have committed murder. If you go back and read the Old Testament, we are just as bad as the Chaldeans. They would make their live children walk through the fire. And that's where you hear the term. They would be uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth. It would hurt the little kids so bad, they would gnash their teeth together. Folks, and we look at them and say, how barbaric. But look at the millions and millions and millions of babies that we kill. 
And now, a vice presidential candidate from a major party ticket, she supports the abortion of the babies after they're born. God help us. If we don't rise up and make our voices known, folks, we are to blame. We know the truth. But oh, how we set back because everything's good at our house. But this new Christian, you want, you want to talk about God. You like singing the songs. We'll even come. We might even come to a Bible study every now and then. Or, you know, I've been to church three times this month. Uh, I've got to go get a new hat so I'll look pretty for church this Sunday. I've got to, I'm going to color up, color up my Bible so people, if they look through it, they'll think I'm reading it. <laughs> Did you know pages stick together? <laughs> so if I ever come over to visit you, if you ever have me over to your house to feed me supper, which after tonight I'll be willing to eat about anything, but uh, if I pick your Bible up and I'm flipping through there, I, I wouldn't do that. I'm just kidding. But the pages shouldn't stick together. Adrian Rogers used to tell, <laughs> he'd say, he said, people in church sometimes, he said, they think their pastor's just so religious. He said, they'll call me at one o'clock in the morning and wake me up and say, oh, pastor, I'm so sorry that I wake you up. He goes, no, nope, I was just going through Proverbs. <laughs> <laughs> We're all human, folks. And these Bibles need to be read. Whether you're the pastor, the Sunday school teacher, uh, in the choir or these Bibles have to be read. This is God in a book. This is our instruction manual. And we've got to talk to God. And I'll, and I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm a better reader than I am prayer. I, I'm not big into long prayers with God, but I talk to God all day long. I, I talk to him like he's right there with me. Because he is. And yes, while I'm gassing my truck up, some people probably look at me a little funny. But that's okay. I'm talking, do you believe God's real? Amen. Do you talk to him throughout the day? Let me ask you something. If there was somebody fixing to kick your door down, you could, you could hear him kicking your door and you're in the back room and you didn't have a gun, would you be talking to God? Amen. If your child was at Children's and they told you there was no hope, would you be talking to God? How many of you tonight have friends and loved ones that are not living for God? And they could die any day, is that right? Are we talking to God? Amen. We need to be. With this new church philosophy, I'm telling you, it scares me. We're starting to preach what people want to hear teach what people want to believe just so they'll come back. My simple argument to that is what good does that do? If they come to church and don't hear the truth, but they come and they put their money in that, in that offering plate and that preacher, he can, got, he can get him a new car or build him a bigger house, but he continues to preach a lie they can go to church every Sunday and die and go straight to hell. A lie is a lie. But listen to what 1 Corinthians 5 and 11. I had never caught this, but I want to show you. 1 Corinthians 5 and 11. I'm going to read you the verse, and then I want, to see if, I want to bring you back to it. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such and one know not eat. If you read that really quick, you'll think you don't ever eat with a fornicator, someone who's covetous, an, idol an idolater, a railer, a drunkard, extortioner, with such one know not eat. In other words, have nothing to do with them. And I've heard people say, well, how would you ever reach the lost if you don't ever have anything to do with them? Back up and look at the word we just read. 
if any man that is called a brother, any man who calls himself a Christian, who goes to church and he lives in these things, it says have nothing to do with him. Folks, we are raising a new church in this country. A new church that says these things right here are okay. You can do any of these things because God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy. And they stop. Is what I just said true? Amen. Our God is a God of love and he is a God of mercy. But they leave off one. He is a just God. He will not be mocked. What a man soweth he shall also reap. All these things. Would you say if the church at Corinth, if Paul had to address it then, it's probably still a problem today? Amen. Let's just read. If a man who calls himself a Christian be a fornicator. You know, I heard, I heard a story about a, pre, a pastor. He, he told this story. He was counseling a couple in his church. Now, when I say couple, you automatically think married couple, right? Wrong. The man and his wife went to church, and the woman and her husband went to the church. But the husband over here and the wife over here was having an affair. And they come to the pastor for counseling. Folks, I'm not a wise counselor, but I can fix that one real quick and in a hurry. And they said, but it's okay. Every time we're together, we pray. I'm like, how blind are we? Folks, this has been a problem back then, and it's a problem now. There's churches that are saying that's okay. Well, they're praying. Who are they praying to? Who's hearing that prayer? Not Jehovah God. We're raising kids to think it's okay to move in before you get married. We're raising a generation that's got quit in them. The first time they get mad at each other, poof, it's over. How many of you would have made it any time at all the first time you got mad at each other? I even seen during Miss Diane's testimony the look that Brother Ken was giving her. <laughs> and we laugh and we need to. But folks, a Christian cannot quit period it's going to get hard folks and i and and god's taking us here i have no idea this was not even part of it god is directing us do not quit be still and know that i am god do you believe god's in control tonight do you believe god's in control tonight Amen. do you believe god is for you then what are we worried about? I know it's hard, folks. I'm just as guilty as any of you. But remember tonight, God is in control and God is for you. He's your biggest cheerleader. You know how much you root for your kids when they play ball? He roots for you more than that. He wants us to do the right thing. He wants us to be, that's why he wants us to read. That's why he wants us to pray. That's why he don't want us to be scorners. That's why he don't want us to be mad at each other. That's why he don't want us to have hate in our heart because he loves us and he don't want us to hurt. We need, this is what I want to close with because I look around this room and this is what makes me feel good about our situation here. We need strong Christian friends more now than we've ever had in our life. And I look around this room and I know that any one of you could dial any number in that directory laying back there at any hour and help's on the way. Now help may be hitting your knees and praying to God, but what better help is that? Does anybody in here doubt for a moment that you could call anybody on that directory and help's coming. I know when those prayer requests start going out, 
that prayers are, start, are, are being prayed. And you know, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So I know your prayers move the hand of God. I want to leave you with this verse. This is where we were kind of coming around to the whole time. Why I don't want us to let the devil in the door. Why I want us to stay strong. Why I want us to support each other. Why I want us to always, like this morning, if Melita's hot and you're cold and you want to turn that thermostat up to heat, think, well, no, that would hurt Melita. Think about others first. We must, folks, there's battles that are coming that if we're, if we're selfish and we're thinking of ourselves, we're going to lose those battles. He's preparing us. Proverbs 27 and 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Let me ask you a question before we close. Has anybody in this room ever helped you with an encouraging word or a prayer? Amen. Folks, keep on keeping on. Things are coming. I'd like to tell you this world's going to get better and everything's going to get great, but that would be a lie. But here's the thing. Let's be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This world may heat that old furnace up seven times hotter, and, they, and the enemy may get us to the door, and the enemy may cast us in, but you hear me tonight. If you have the faith and hold on to the hand out the other side of the fire, you will come. If you would, stand with me all over this building. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes tonight. Folks, I know there's dark times coming. Some of us are already in dark times. I'm telling you tonight, be still. God is in control. God will always be in control. And he loves you and he's for you. You need to remember that tonight. He's got you. Just hold on. If you do not have that, if God is not your anchor tonight and your ship is being tossed about, you need to make Jesus Christ the anchor of your heart. You need to come to this altar and give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. Friend, it's, it's an eternal decision. Because you see, our life here on earth is short. But our life and eternity is forever. You need to make things right tonight. If he's not your savior, all you got to do is come and ask him into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. And then do everything the best you can to turn and repent from your sins and live for him. Maybe you're already a child of God. And the water's rough. And maybe you forgot that you were anchored. I promise you tonight, you're anchored. If you just need a touch from God tonight, this altar's open. We'll invite you in, and, and you can pray and talk to God. You don't have to go through anybody down here. You can talk directly to Jesus Christ. If you just need anything tonight, this altar's open.